Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, so the, the paper that the um, results that I'm about to talk about were recently published. Um, so with that, I would actually like to start with the uh, acknowledgements of my collaborators. Um, so the guys at Claremont University in France, so these guys did uh, the theory. They worked on the rate equations and adapted uh, the coupled couple oscillator model. Uh, the guys in Tokyo, the University of Tokyo and Riken, these guys were these guys uh, grew th our thin film and also performed the initial magnetometry of our um, thin film. And then also University of Dortmund, um, so these guys did the magneto optical circular dichroism, uh, measuring the spin dynamics, and this fed directly back into our rate equation. And then everyone else at the University of Sheffield who uh, helped me with the magneto-optical spectroscopy in a tunable microcavity. So we've probably heard quite a lot about the basics of transition metal dichrocogenides um, from an experimental point of view. Uh, I want to highlight the fact that how easy they are to isolate these monolayers. Um, so we actually buy them in bulk. You can see an example over here. And then just through micro-mechanical exfoliation or the sticky blue tape method, uh, we can quite easily obtain uh, monolayers. And then from an optics perspective, uh, we see that the, um, the band gap goes from an indirect momentum, indirect band gap in bulk, and switches to a direct band gap in the monolay limit. And this is formed at two equivalent values at K and K primed in the uh, Brullian zone. And then thanks to the inversion symmetry breaking in the monolayer, um, this lifts the degeneracy at the K and K prime or the K plus, K minus uh, valleys, such that the spin states in these two valleys are opposite. Um, so when we get down to a monolayer, um, the uh, optical properties of these materials are highly excitonic. So we get about 15% absorption uh, based on these excitons. And so the neutral exciton, which is just an electron hole pair, um, this has a very large binding energy uh, due to the quantum confinement in the 2D layer. And this leads to uh, very large binding energies, so about 200 to 700, depending on the material. And this is clearly visible at room temperature as well as low temperature. Um, however, the most of our studies are done at low temperature. Um, we can see uh, some more slightly exotic um, versions of excitons, so here we have the negative trion, which is simply an exciton um, with an excess electron bound, so this has a uh, binding energy of about 25 MeV. And this is very prominent in the PL spectra and also the absorption spectra at low temperature. So again, most of our work is done in two, a zero-dimensional tunable microcavity, so when we play, place a highly absorb, absorbive absorptive material into our cavity. So we have, this is uh, a graphic of our cavity. This is an actual photo. So we have the, we have a series of eight piezo stages. So we have X, Y, Z in both top and bottom, which control the bottom DBR and the top DBR. And then we also have a two tilt stages, uh, which make sure our confinement between the two DBRs is uh, maximal. So when we have everything aligned, uh, we just tune the Z stage and you tune the um, cavity mode into resonance with our exciton. And then the onset of this polaritons is quite clearly defined by this anti-crossing between the LPB and UPB. And you can see if we um, focus on the LPB, the away to so negatively detuned from highest resonance, uh, we're highly uh, photonic, so the cavity mode. And then as we tune through the resonance uh, and beyond, we become highly excitonic. And then at the point of maximum um, Rabi splitting, defined as the minimum um, distance between the UPB and the LPB, we actually have maximum 50-50 share between the uh, exciton um, part and the uh, uh, cavity part. And then the strength of this Rabi splitting is uh, related directly to the cavity mode volume and also the oscillator strength of the excitons. So um, in a fixed cavity mode volume, uh, we actually 
how Rabi splitting is directly related to an oscillator strength of our extons. So the material that I would like to present here is molybdenum diselenides. Um, it's one of the first TMDs um, studied. It's, it's well, well studied at this point. Um, so the uh, low temperature, we can see that it has highly excitonic optical properties. And you can see that the neutral exciton has a very large oscillator strength. And naturally, um, the trion has quite a smaller um, relative to our neutral exciton. And what's quite interesting uh, about MOSI2 is that the band structure combines a coupled spin and valley physics so that you, with the chiral optical selection rules, and this means that you can optically address uh, one valley or the other through our circular um, polarization. So you address K plus with uh, sigma plus and vice versa. So in this work, we use a thin film of European sulfide um, this is deposited onto our top layer of DBR, silicon dioxide, uh, via E-beam evaporation. So EUS is an insulating ferromagnetic material. Uh, it has a very weak and broad absorption, beginning about 1.65 electron volts, which comes into play a little bit later. Uh, it also has a Curie temperature of about 17 Kelvin. Um, this is a squid measurement measured at the time of growth. Um, and then we transfer our molybdenum diselenide monolayer on top via PDMS transfer. Um, in our studies, we actually see no ferromagnetic influence of EUS on the molybdenum diselenide. Uh, we think this is for two main reasons. Uh, firstly, the PDMS transfer um, means that the interface between these two layers is very weak. Uh, basically, inserts a barrier between the two of them. And then secondly, we found recently that the EUS layers uh, actually oxidize quite quickly. Um, however, what we do get from our EUS, uh, thanks to the growth process at 16 degrees uh, Celsius and the low sulfur vapor pressure, we actually see that the sulfur atoms during uh, growth uh, re-evaporate and the sulfur vac vacancies act as electron donors. And potentially by controlling the growth process, we could potentially get a controlled um, doping uh, via EUS of our, into our molybdenum diselenide. Um, but in this study so far, uh, yeah, that's not been verified. Um, we can repeatedly get the same level of doping, so about 10 to 12 um, excess electrons, um, but it's, uh, we haven't played with changing the growth parameters just yet. So when we cool down our sample and introduce magnetic fields, um, so initially, thanks to our large N-doping uh, in our PL emission, we actually s only see the trion resonance. And this is due to the large amount of um, doping, so we have a high uh, Fermi energy. However, in absorption, you can see both uh, resonances, so trion and exciton. And what happens when we introduce a magnetic field, um, we see our 2D electron gas gets fully spin polarized at about 4 tesla. Uh, this has been confirmed in previous reports as well. Um, but what this means for us, because in molybdenum diselenide, our uh, ground state trion is inter valley, so that, say, at uh, sigma plus over here, if you introduce an electron, it um, bounds with an excess uh, trion situated in the opposite valley. So in eight, at plus 8 tesla, we have our um, 2D electron gas situated in the K minus valley, and this leads to a high. Uh, oscillator strength of our sigma plus trion state. And the vice, vice versa is true. So if you introduce a trion and sigma minus, you actually have zero electrons to couple to. And this gives you a zero amount of um, oscillator strength. We see that the PL is close to 80% degree of circular polarization compared to 100% in the reflectance contrast. And so this means that um, we see some kind of depolarization mechanism due to the non-resonant circular wave pump laser. And this is the, um, the rate equation that we developed. Uh, so when the pump is activated, we form excitons very rapidly, so it's a picosecond kind of time scale. And then these uh, excitons bind with the excess electrons to form trions. And we know that bound trions, in thanks to the intervalley um, constitution of them, uh, these depolarize quite quickly over the course of a few picoseconds. 
and then when these trans decay, they leave an excess, elec uh, an excess electron, uh, which is now depolarized. And free charges take a much longer time to realign with the um, magnetic field, so over the course of a few nanoseconds. So the, the ratio between the two, uh, so the depolarization and the repolarization, is a, about a factor of a thousand. And we can also see that um, we're still in a linear uh, power response regime, so we're not having any saturation effects. And you can see quite clearly this uh, degree of circular polarization decreases as we increase the power. So what this means when we um, put it into our um, cavity, um, so when we tune our um, cavity mode, uh, we can see very clearly a um, Zim, uh, sorry, a Rabi splitting between the LPB and the UPB. Um, and I should mention as well that so since strong coupling occurs about the um, absorption resonance, this is labeled here as TRC, and our measurements are in PL. Um, so the cavity mode, when it's highly excitonic, tends towards the PL. So this is where our reservoir of excitons are. However, the, the Rabi splitting happens about the um, absorption resonance, and this gives us a strong uh, Stokes shift again, thanks to the amount of doping. And this means that the LPB actually pins back, like bends back towards the PL state. Um, and then when we introduce our magnetic field, you can see that the um, spin polarization of the 2D electron gas actually means that we get this spin selective strong coupling. So in sigma minus, you see that the cavity mode essentially travels straight through the resonances, whereas in sigma plus, we get this large opening of the um, Rabi splitting. So in order to compare the two LPBs, we just form this waterfall plot as a function of um, piezo voltage. So this controls the, essentially the cavity length. As we increase the piezo voltage, uh, we decrease the cavity length, and we tune the um, cavity mode towards higher energies. Uh, so at zero Tesla, we see that both um, sigma plus and sigma minus um, act in the same way. However, again, at, uh, at eight Tesla, we see that the sigma plus actually starts to get pinned by our uh, exciton resonance, whereas the sigma minus continues to travel straight through our, um, our exciton resonance, our trion resonance. Um, and this opens up a very large um, Zeeman splitting between the two LPB modes. And if you plot the valley Zeeman splitting as a function of magnetic field, in the bare flake versus our triangle polariton, you see that the bare flake is about, has a G factor, valley, Z valley splitting G factor of about four, which is to be expected. When you go to a polariton mode, you actually expect it to be half because you are half uh, cavity, half excitonic. Um, whereas here, because of this spin selective strong coupling, we actually see an increase in our G factor of about five times. So, again, thanks to the depolarization mechanism that we can see in the bare flake, we increase the power in, uh, in the cavity mode, in the cavity state. And you can see that, again, at zero Tesla, these two modes are exactly the same. And we ha then when we introduce magnetic fields, you get the cavity mode traveling straight through our resonance. And in sigma plus, it uh, opens up to a maximum. As we increase the power, thanks to this depolarization mechanism, we actually start to see a Rabi splitting open up in the sigma minus, and it starts to decrease slightly in the sigma plus polarizations. And then by about 500 uh, microwatts, you can see that they tend, start to tend towards the same um, back towards our kind of equal state between the two polarizations. Um, and then what's quite unique about this system is that um, when we look at, for example, the Rabi splitting uh, versus laser power, our highest nonlinearities occur at our lowest laser powers. Um, and so when we look at the effective interaction strength over here, we get our largest interaction strength at our lowest powers. And this value of 0.2 is actually about 10 times larger than was previously reported in molybdenum diselenide triumph polaritons. And this, again, is all thanks to the uh, spin-selective um, strong coupling. 
So um, hopefully I've managed to convince you that EUS might be able to, can uh, effectively dope monolayer semiconductor. It can, we can do it reliably. Uh, potentially we could do it controllably if we experiment, if we wanted to go in that direction. Um, we've shown an all optical tuning of the 2D electron gas spin polarization in our doped monolayer molybdenum diselenides. And in turn, when you play th place this into an optical microcavity, we've shown an all optical tuning of our Rabi splitting and then we've shown value selective strong coupling leads to a very high effective Zeeman splitting over five times that of in the bare flake. And then also that the lowest laser pump powers offer the highest nonlinearities. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all the collaborators that helped with this work over the course of a couple of years. And then also you for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so this is based on, this calculation is based on the difference in energy between the two modes. So it, when you measure this at uh, the bare flake trion, you get what is essentially the same as the, um, the valley, the shift in the valley state. So this represents the actual Zeeman splitting between the two, the K plus and the K minus valleys. Whereas thanks to this um, spin selective effectively pinning our sigma plus uh, LPB compared to the sigma minus, which effectively just keeps going, you can see that this opens a very large Zeeman splitting. So this uh, calculation is based on the energy difference between these two modes, just to highlight the, the kind of the extent at which, the, I guess, the, the increase in what we'd expect. You transfer the molybdenum diselenide in air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, uh, so, just in order to improve the interface, have you tried to do annealing after transferring? Um, we've not done annealing. Um, we're looking at doing stuff in a glove box, so we're trying to avoid the uh, effect of air. Um, and we're also kind of just trying to characterize the amount of how much the EUS oxidizes and how quickly as well. We're not sure, because it's grown in Japan and they need to ship it over, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not always yes. um, perfectly viable to do everything in one place. Um, um, initially, we wanted to see um, in uh, this kind of um, magnetic exchange. Um, so yeah, that's what we wanted to see. We didn't see that at all. <laughs> Instead, we get this um, this kind of different direction, which kind of worked out. Um, it's something that we, we're trying to circle back to and trying to understand a little bit more and see if EUS is actually a viable material to do that. Um, our current results suggest it might not be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Specific for participation to the writing paper. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Yeah, now